Okay, now to talk on Chesterton Belloc within, the, within the, the, I say, within the constraints of what we've just discussed, I'd like to select one particular year as a starting point, and it might be an appropriate year uh, to select as a starting point on, for several reasons. The year is 1900, so just over 100 years ago, and the beginning of a new century. And it seems that uh, quite loads of significant things happened that year, but I'm going to select three. In 1900, we saw the death of Oscar Wilde. We saw the death of Friedrich Nietzsche. And we saw the birth of the Chester Belloc, um, a creature so named by George Bernard Shaw. Well, we'll come to the Chester Belloc in just a moment. It seems that Oscar Wilde, um, uh, if you like, symbolised progress uh, progress leading to decay, to decadence. He was sort of the vanguard of the English decadence, if you like. Uh, Charles Baudelaire uh, and Paul Verlaine were the vanguard of the French decadence, which preceded it by about 20 years. But this sort of decay symbolising a break with traditional morality. And it's very significant for Chesterton, as we shall see, because the decadence was influential upon Chesterton in a certain way. Oscar Wilde, in 1900, the death of Oscar Wilde also saw him being received into the Catholic Church on his deathbed, which I'm sure many of uh, the, those that hold um, Oscar Wilde up as a sexual liberator and as a gay icon are unaware of the fact that he basically turned his back on all of those sexual mores and embraced the Church. And also, 1900 says, so the death of Friedrich Nietzsche. And Friedrich Nietzsche died in 1900 after 12 years of insanity, which was preceded by a lifetime of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, he believed uh, that God was dead, that society had progressed beyond religion, and that we now needed a superman, an ubermensch, to replace the mediocre. We had to sweep away the meek and the weak and embrace the strong and the superman, the ubermensch. So this is 1900. In the same year, Chesterton and Belloc first met. That's why I say the birth of the Chester Belloc. And in many respects, the Chester Belloc, thus called, was Christened, if that's the right word, baptised by George Bernard Shaw in an essay published a few years after this, in which he said that Chesterton and Belloc were now seen so synonymously that they made up two halves of a rather amusing pantomime elephant. <laughs> now I can see from the fact we've got some laughs there that some people do know what pantomime is here. But um, pantomime is say, very much an English thing, and of course Shaw's joke was such that one of the creatures you have uh, in a pantomime is a pantomime horse, normally, whereas a, a man makes up the front part of the horse, and another man, obviously, is in that position, <laughs> makes up the back part of the horse. So the pantomime elephant was alluding to the fact that not only they were this sort of absurd creature, but they were both somewhat rotund, <laughs> <laughs> which, of course, they were. Um, and that brings me, just another quick aside, to the wonderful example of Chesterton's humour, during the First World War, um, someone, or, you know, it was in the, people used to hand out white feathers for cowardice if you hadn't enlisted uh, to go out and fight uh, in the trenches. And um, Chesterton, of course, was somewhat large. And he was on an omnibus in London, and this woman came up to him and said, Sir, I hope you're ashamed of yourself for not being out in the front. And Chester said, Madam, if you go down to my side, you'll see that I am. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, you can imagine that Chesterton in the trenches that have to have probably winched him in, uh, and over the top they have to winch him out again. <laughs> so we have these sort of, uh, this pantomime elephant. And yes, Gavor, Gavors, I'm laughing, yes, Jollity. Yes, ale, yes, yes, songs. H.G. Uh, Wells proclaimed that Chesterton and Belloc had succeeded 
in placing a boozy halo around Catholicism. <laughs> to which they both probably raised their flag and they went, cheers. <laughs> but of course there's a much more serious side to the Chester Belloc than that. And when Chesterton first met Belloc, it really was, they, they were meeting actually uh, at a protest uh, against the Boer War in South Africa, where both Belloc and Chesterton were against the war, and they supported the small farmers, uh, the Boer farmers against the British Empire, effectively. But what, uh, I'm not being this, the wonderful quotes, I could have just cut, turned up with both of my books and read you quotes, but uh, you know, in a 40 minute talk, uh, if I read you loads of quotes, we wouldn't get an awful lot of uh, material in. So the other thing I'm going to do it by way of making an apology is I have no quotes at all and when I quote Chesterton and Belloc I, it, it's not going to be uh, word perfect and so don't sort of, I, in other words I apologise to the purists now. It's really from memory, it's paraphrased quotes. But Belloc immediately struck Chesterton as someone with wide horizons. Chesterton was uh, she's four years younger than, uh, than Belloc. He was born in uh, 1874, Belloc was born in 1870. But the different distance between them was far greater than four years. Because by 1900, uh, Belloc was married, already had children, he um, trekked uh, halfway across the United States. That's an exaggeration. The, the myth was he walked all the way across the United States to claim the hand of Elodie. As you may know, he married a Californian girl uh, of Irish descent, Elodie Hogan. Uh, and the, the, the myth is that he walked from the East Coast to California. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, that wasn't exactly what happened. He, he got a train. <laughs> <laughs> However, I mean, you know, lest, we, lest we pour scorn on, 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 on Belloc's uh, um, robustness, when Elodie turned him down, you know, having travelled away from Europe, all the way across the United States in the 18, early 1890s, you know, the World West had only just become a bit tame, um, to get all the way out there to be told to be turned down because uh, Eleni thought she had a vocation uh, with the Sisters of Mercy. And then he basically walked heartbroken and uh, uh, virtually penniless from the San Francisco Bay Area to the mountains of Colorado. Um, uh, as far as we can see, just about walked the whole way. Um, so that's pretty impressive. It might not be halfway across the United States, but uh, I'm sure most of us would think twice about doing it. And eventually borrowed money from a stranger to get him the rest of the way back home. So he'd done this. He'd, he'd trekked and tramped across the United States. He'd served for a year in the French army. So he was married. He had children. Uh, he'd been published, not only published, but published best-selling uh, uh, poems. They caution me verses. Um, so the uh, Bad Child's Book of Beasts. Um, and so he was known, he was famous as a writer, he was an, an adventurer. Chesterton at this stage was only just beginning to get published and newspaper columns. Uh, 1900 was when his, his first uh, book was published. So it's almost a mentor situation at that stage. Now as, um, and the letter he wrote to to his fiancée at the time, Chesterton wrote to his fiancée, Francis, about Belloc, was that, you know, that this man is really sort of like a, a warrior, he's sort of the, the image of Roland and these great heroes of Christendom in his language about Belloc. And as the years went by, uh, in some ways that balance was addressed, because as Chesterton grew in faith and in wisdom and in stature, in many respects Belloc became, came to actually in some ways to depend upon Chesterton, because Chesterton's, uh, I mean, Belloc's faith was never weak, but Belloc was uh, uh, naturally a sceptic, and that these are his own words, naturally a sceptic. In other words, he said once that faith is an act of the will, which of course is leaving out grace, but we won't get into the theology on it, but certainly there is an element of will in faith, and Chesterton, I uh, say Belloc was well aware of that fact. Chesterton he seemed to just live and breathe Catholicism once that he had embraced Catholicism. So this is how their relationship developed. But they became the two of them, the Chester Bellot, as great defenders 
of Christian tradition and Christian orthodoxy against the heresies of the age. Now, the um, the two. Uh, sorry, I'm just. <laughs> There's my, my wonderful Hector in the back there. <laughs> no, no, you're fine, you're fine. It's just. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Hector's going to spend it. <laughs> Most of them aren't any more articulate than that. <laughs> but, but Chesterton and Bellock's big enemies in the first years of the 20th century were H.G. Wells and George Bernard Shaw. And if you like, if Chesterton and Bellock represented the voice of Christian tradition, if, if, if as a pair they almost symbolised that, at least in the literary world of the early 20th century, Wells and Shaw uh, symbolised the alternative, liberal secularism, modernism, uh, the belief in progress, the belief in science. So this is the, these are the two sides. I want to discuss some of this now because in 1905, um, Chesterton uh, published a book called Heretics. And amongst the heretics that he attacked were Nietzsche. And he, he said one thing about Nietzsche, he said, Nietzsche's maxim that the one command I give to you be strong is like saying the one command I give to you be dead. Because he said, sorry, I think that might be strong. I think um, Nietzsche's word would be hard. And Chester said, that's like saying, be dead. And he said, sensibility is the definition of life. And the harder you get, the less alive you are. So he attacked Nietzsche. Now, Shaw was in many respects a popularizer, a Nietzschean populist, if you like. He also believed in the Superman. And Shaw sort of believed that we, humanity, without the existence of God, this is some sort of, I don't know how they, how they come to these, these uh, modernists come to these sort of things, but there is no God, but somehow we are all evolving to become better and better and better, so we all really become gods. We, 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 we evolve towards perfection, and we're evolving towards the Superman. And of course the same sort of terminology Nietzsche would use, the Superman. So Shaw was very much a popularizer of Nietzsche, and Chesterton uh, attacked Shaw at some length, and in fact, in the end, wrote a whole book on George Bernard Shaw. One of the best attacks in heretics, though, was against H.G. Wells, and one of the things he attacked H.G. Wells for was his belief, ultimately, in might is right. And he basically says that one of Wells' science fiction stories is effectively a retelling of the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, or Jack the Giant Killer, from the point of view of the giant. You know, that basically the big man is right and let's crush all these non-entities. And Chesterton said, you know, this is very, very unhealthy and very, very dangerous, and it's healthy to support Jack and to be on Jack's side in that fairy story. The, uh, the support for the small and the weak and the meek against the straw. And someone responded to Chesterton by saying, well, I'll take Chesterton's, who Chesterton decides is a heretic seriously, when Chesterton proclaims to us his own orthodoxy. Now, of course, you know, this is this, in the sort of relative, relativistic uh, haze of modern life, you know, his own orthodoxy, really, that the writer was saying, let's hear his opinion. His opinion. His orthodoxy is really just opinion. Everybody's opinion. So, Chesterton, always one to rise to a challenge, published Orthodoxy uh, a few years later, three years later. And in the introduction of Orthodoxy, he referred to this challenge. He said someone said, I'll, I'll listen to what uh, Chesterton has to say about heretics when he defines his own orthodoxy. He said, that's what I'm going to do now. And what he did at this time, he was not a, a, a Catholic, he was a High Church of England. But orthodoxy was taking the Apostles' Creed. And taking the Apostles' Creed and showing how an understanding of the Apostles' Creed is the key to understanding reality. Key to understanding truth objectively. 
Now, this of course in some ways is a precursor of um, uh, C.S. Lewis's mere Christianity. Because you know, C.S. Lewis's mere Christianity is trying to say, well, Lewis is trying to say, what are all the things that the major Christian denominations have in common? Let's take that as our starting point and let's call this mere Christianity. <coughs> Um, Chesterton is basically saying the Apostles' Creed, I as an Anglican can believe in this, the Roman Catholics believe in this, uh, and most Eastern Orthodox believe in this, and most Protestants believe in this. Um, so that's uh, where he's starting from. Of course the difference between Chesterton and, and, uh, uh, and Lewis is that Chesterton was already effectively a Catholic when he wrote this, uh, and anybody can go back and read Orthodoxy and I'll defy them to find it anything in there which is not Catholic. And of course, and this is just a stage on his uh, road to conversion, because he was received into the Catholic Church some years later. And Chesterton said that people loved him when he they just saw him as a wit, as a, uh, someone who was funny, a jolly journalist who had these very witty paradoxes. But the moment they began to realise that he believed in what he was saying, it wasn't a joke, it wasn't a pose like Oscar Wilde, it was what he really believed, then he was perceived as a threat and an enemy. A lot of people that were friends of Chesterton um, prior to that, or at least friendly voices towards Chesterton, became antagonistic from orthodoxy onward in 1908. In the same year, uh, Chester wrote, uh, which is probably his best novel, The Man Who Was Thursday. And The Man Who Was Thursday, uh, in many respects, was a riposte to uh, Oscar Wilde and to the decadence. Now, Chesterton was at the Slane School of Art in the early 1890s when Wilde and the English decadence were at their most influential. And we know that uh, from an early novel that's recently been published, Basil Howe, uh, early novel of Chesterton's, that was written about the time he was at the Slate School of Art, all of these sort of decadent poses in some of the characters are present. It's never convincing with Chesterton, it's quite clear that Chesterton was never, never convincing as a decadent because he was never convinced that he was one. Um, but nonetheless, the influence is there. And there's a wonderful essay by Chesterton called The Diabolist, where he talks about uh, a real-life encounter he had with a fellow student, presumably at the, at the Slade School of Art, and how they were talking about things, and this person was in his nonchalant fashion, was saying that what you believe to be good, you know, I believe to be evil, what you believe to be evil, I believe to be good, you know, and, uh, and he was talking calmly about ruining the reputation of women and things like that. And Chester stood up and said, in a healthy, in a healthy living democracy, you'd be burned. <laughs> <laughs> and walks out. And as he walks out, he hears uh, a conversation this chap um, has, when he says, or a little while after he hears a conversation, this chap says, if I do that, I will cease to know the difference between right and wrong. And said, Chester said, I don't know what it was. That, uh, that he was referring to. Uh, but this, it was this, ultimately this repulsion, this repugnance towards the decadence that led Chesterton to go the opposite direction. And he rejected the pessimism that, just, that was inherent uh, in much of the decadence and became uh, someone who had gratitude and humility and just thanksgiving. So The Man Who Was Thursday was a novel where Chesterton says it was really working out all this hot, pessimistic atmosphere of the 1890s. But it's much, much more than that, and I don't really have time to go in too much length about The Man Who Was Thursday. May I ask, how many people have read, have read The Man Who Was Thursday here? So, yeah, a few. But uh, how many people have read it more than once? <laughs> okay. Because I suggest that The Man Who's Thursday probably is one of those books that you have to read it uh, more than once to start to really get it. Uh, it's uh, it's a, to be one of the great novels of the 20th century. But effectively, the situation is that all of these people uh, believe that the world is really 
dark in one way or another for one reason or another and they all really started from different philosophical positions from the nihilistic position to the decadent position the atheist um, no, there's various different positions and they all think the world is dark and unloved and it's basically a detective story and a mystery story but in the end it all turns around that the person they all thought was the enemy is actually the friend of the capital F in fact is God himself so really what we have Testament working out here is that as he says somewhere else, we don't live in the best of all possible worlds. We live in the best of all impossible worlds. You know, because basically, where, where we are, what we are, even the merest speck of dust is impossible. Unless it's been, unless it's been loved into existence by something omnipotent. So we have this new force. And in history, three major poems Chesterton wrote on history, all about the central role of Christendom. In the Ballad of the White Horse, we see him basically talking about the defence of England, of Christian England, of Anglo-Saxon Christian England under Alfred the Great from the pagan barbarian invasions uh, of the Vikings, of the Danes. And so that poem reminds us very much of the Song of Roland. And it's basically, it's a, it's, it's a cry uh, for uh, the crusade. And during the First World War, the line from the poem, the high tide, King Alfred said, the high tide and the turn, was actually printed at the top of a time editorial um, when the war was turning the right way. But that referred to the invasion of uh, the Vikings into England. And it looked as if Christian England would be overthrown by the pagans. And they get so far at the Battle of Ethandun, and then the high tide, King Alfred said, the high tide of the turn. This is as far as they are coming, and then they will be turned back and driven out. And Christian England is saved. And a very similar theme we have in his poem Lepanto. And his poem Lepanto, of course, which in my opinion is probably his finest poem, um, is about the Battle of Lepanto, a naval battle, uh, where Don John of Austria basically saves Europe from a Muslim fleet. And we know that uh, this perfect ending to the poem about Miguel Cervantes, who um, who was actually fought during, fought in that battle, is the final stanza of the poem. Maybe I'll mention that briefly in a moment. <clears throat> but the key thing about that poem, of course, you have the Pope calling for Christendom to unite against this Muslim threat, calling for prayers, calling for the rosary. And what do we find? We have the King of Spain is corrupt. We have the vanity and corruption of the Valois of France. We have the hardness of heart of Elizabeth I in England, who of course had turned her back on the faith. So you have a, a completely and utterly disunited Christendom arguing amongst itself. It takes one hero, Don John of Austria, to gather, gather enough Christian forces to um, defeat that Muslim navy, that Muslim fleet. And say so the last stanza about Miguel Cervantes, in some ways it's a bit of an anticlimax because the rest of it is hurrah, hurrah, and uh, for, you know, for Don John of Austria. And the last, the last stanza sort of really brings the whole thing down almost anticlimactically about Miguel Cervantes putting his sword back in his sheath. But of course, that's the point. Because if that battle hadn't been won, then Don Quixote would never have been written. Don Quixote here, of course, symbolising Christian culture, Christian literature. Because if Europe had been overrun by Islam, this Christian culture would have died. So in fact, what appears as an anticlimax at the end of the poem is in fact its point. 
And then another great poem by Chesterton on, on an historic theme is The Secret People. Not quite so well known, but that really is about how England was robbed of the faith. How the greed of those in power, from the king and the king's servants, robbed the English peasantry of their faith and destroyed the abbeys, which were the only place that the poor could go when they were ill or hungry. And then in Belloc, we have the Path to Rome, his early book. It's a celebration, if you like, of Christendom. He walks from France, from Turin in France, over the Alps, into Italy, uh, arriving in Rome on the feast of St. Peter and St. Paul, which was his oath that he would do that on foot. And it, it's, a, it's a celebration of Christendom, but it's also, in some ways, a celebration of the remnants of Christendom. And this is even more true in the Vegas Book of Four Men, which is a celebration of Christendom. If you like, you have in both Chester and Belloc the big picture. Europe, the Europe of the faith. The faith is Europe, and Europe is the faith. Belloc's words. Then you have the small picture, little England, little Catholic England, and in Belloc's case, little Sussex, little Catholic Sussex. And this theology of place, that individual small place, is home. The theology of place to me is profound. Because really, this sense of home is linked to our sense of exile. Because our true home is in heaven. But our wanting home, feeling at home, in a certain place, is a foretaste and a sign of that home in heaven. So in the four men we have this celebration of Christendom, but Christendom merely within a small corner of England, which is only 70 miles from east to west. And then we have Belloc as an historian, as a serious historian. And Belloc set out single-handedly, almost literally single-handedly, Chesterton attempted to help, but he wasn't a historian on, on, on Belloc's level, to rewrite the Protestant bias of English history. Now I know about this from first-hand experience because you know, I grew up with this Protestant bias of English history. Basically, they say, of course, we know the cliche that history is written by the victors. But it's certainly true that English history has been written by the weak historians who take the view that the Reformation liberated England and liberated the Englishman from Rome from superstition, and all the great moments in English history which led to greater freedom for the English, started with the Reformation. So, 1534, Henry VIII uh, established the Church of England, a great moment. Um, then we have uh, um, the defeat of the Spanish Armada, a great moment. And 1605, the gunpowder plot. You know, when the, the, an evil popist plot to overthrow the government was uncovered. Great moment. And it's quite interesting, by the way. The, there, there's a church near where I used to live in Norfolk. They've got this old Anglican service book from the early 1700s. And the Anglican church got rid of all holy days because they didn't believe in venerating the saints. And they put this, that was idolatrous. But November the 5th was a, a holy day where you were fined if you didn't go to church. So they have a holy day to commemorate the burning to death of a Catholic. But they won't have a holy day to commemorate St. Peter or St. Paul. Strange religion. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of Chesterton's other words about you know how these people talk about the idolatrous crucifix. They, they hold up the crucifix. This is idolatry. Look. And they take the man off the cross and they worship the wood. Now what is idolatry? You remove the man and worship the wood. Just the cross. The cross is okay. The cross is idolatrous. But putting Christ on the cross becomes idolatry. <coughs> yeah. So. And then we have the glorious revolution. 1688, 
when uh, the legitimate king, James II, was overthrown by the Dutch usurper, uh, William of Orange. And that was the end of the Catholic monarchy in England. All of these are moments of glory in English history. Thomas Cranmer is glorious and a martyr, etc. So, Belloc sets off. He writes a book, How the Reformation Happened. He writes another book, Characters of the Reformation. He writes individual biographies of Cranmer, <coughs> James II, Charles I, Charles II. He basically attacks this weak history, history saying, no, this is not what happened, this is what happened. Now, of course, Belloc is attacked. Well, surely, you know, we can't be expected to take Belloc seriously as an objective. Historian of the man's a rabid Catholic. <laughs> well, there are two things I'd say to that. First of all, at the very, very least, if you had 250 years of a, a completely and utterly biased anti Catholic version of history rammed down the throats of Englishmen, then it's about time that someone at least gave the other side of the story so that at least available. For someone wanting to know the truth, or they can read that one and that one. They can read that biography of James II and that biography of James II to see both sides of the story. So at the very least, Belloc was providing a much needed counterbalance to the bias that was already there. However, we know uh, that from other works since then, by Christopher Dawson, and more recently, of course, by Eamon Duffy, The Stripping of the Altar, <coughs> that you know, much of what Belloc was saying was true. We know that many of his contemporaries, historians, that weren't Catholics, <coughs> accepted him as a, a, as a first-rank historian. And we also know, in the early 18, 1990s, we don't know about, about 10 years ago, Professor Norman Stone, who as far as I, I'm aware is not a Catholic, who's a current professor of modern history at Oxford University, says that he wants to know what really happened in England during the time of the Reformation and soon after, he wouldn't go to Trevelyan and Macaulay and the Whig historians, he would go to Hilaire Belloc and Lord Acton, both Catholics. So I would say it's not just a question of a balance, I think that Belloc is getting somewhere close to the objective truth <coughs> in this. The other really big thing in history um, that Belloc and Chester were involved in was a rebuttal and then you cost to H.G. Wells' Outline of History. Now, H.G. Wells wrote a book called The Outline of History. There's been a, a, a lot, a much controversy fairly recently about how much of it was plagiarised from a, a, a work of history that a, a Canadian woman had written and, and submitted to, uh, to Wells' publishers. Uh, but anyway, I won't go into that. Regardless who wrote it, certainly Chesterton and Belloc believed that Wells wrote it, and Wells took the credit for writing it. So Wells' Outline of History basically was looking at history as if it's a progress from the primitive uh, ape man through the sort of evolution towards, pro towards modern science that was overcoming all the superstitions of the past. And for instance, Wells uses more, there, there's, there are more words in his biography, more space in his history, uh, to the Assyrian Empire than it is to uh, the life of Christ in the Christian Church. So this uh, bias there. Now Belloc, this sort of history was like uh, a red rag to a bull to Belloc. <laughs> and he um, went for Wells' jugular and, played, and uh, wrote a book um, uh, wrote loads of articles, sorry, in loads of different magazines, just refuting various points in Wells' book. Um, Wells writes a book in reply to these attacks by Belloc, entitled Mr. Belloc Objects, um, to which Belloc wrote a book entitled Mr. Belloc Still Objects. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Belloc claimed to have written over a hundred thousand words in refutation of the historical analysis of Wells, the outline of history, and it became very, very acrimonious between the two of them. 
Chesterton's response, and this shows us uh, uh, one of the difference between Belloc and Chesterton. Because whereas Belloc went out, all guns blazing, bare-fisted, that's mixing my metaphors, but does it matter? <laughs> um, <laughs> he went out and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, attacked Wells, so he went for the jugular. Chesterton just didn't mention Wells at all, he just wrote a book called The Everlasting Man. And The Everlasting Man was just uh, ultimately a reply to the outline of history without Chesterton ever referring to Wells. <coughs> and Chesterton finished and starts this off, this book off, uh, with the man in the cave. And he says, you know, what's all this about our assumption that uh, the Stone Age man was a primitive that used to drag his wife around by his hair, by her hair, not his hair, and that was the part of civilized. Um, they used to drag their wife around by, by, by her hair and then beat her over the head, and then if she uh, didn't behave herself, they would probably eat her. <laughs> now, this was a primitive picture of an early man being no better than an ape. In fact, this wouldn't be worse, because I don't think apes behave that way. <laughs> so Chesterton says, okay, let's look at the evidence. What do we actually know? When we go into caves, where these people were supposed to live, what do we actually know? Do we see piles of bones of former wives that also made great lunches? <laughs> no, we don't. What do we see? We actually see art. We see not only art, but good art. Chester, of course, speaks as an artist, he's at the Slate School of Art, that's what he began as, that's what he wanted to be. And he's a considerable artist and the right. He said, the way that those people got a line where you see a, a deer running, and you get the sense of motion, you've got the head swung back so that the, the deer is, uh, is eyeing its pursuers, that sense of, of curve, that sense of motion, he said, is, a, is the sort of artistic skill that many artists of our own day would love to have. That's the evidence. And they said, you know, how do we even know they lived in caves? Let's say this happened, these people were living, let's say, 30,000 years ago. One of them. I'm not in the story. 30,000 years ago. If they lived in wooden houses, how many of them would still be there? <laughs> you know, they could live in wooden houses, they, they may have gone and painted in the caves. They may have painted on the wooden houses, but the paintings haven't survived. The only ones that survived are the ones in the cave. That's the evidence. And this is what Chester, Chester basically goes back and just look. And of course, the whole point was <coughs> Wells was basing his um, conclusions upon. <coughs> A supercilious chronological snobbery. You know, a belief that every generation was better and superior to the previous generation. That humanity was progressing towards ever greater wisdom, and therefore, by definition, you knew more than your father. Okay. Chesterton, if you mention. Uh, Great works of apologetics, you think of Chesterton as orthodoxy, and Chester as the everlasting man, at least within the 20th century context. Few people I said, well, let's, let's put this to the test. How many people have read Orthodoxy by Chesterton? Okay. How many people have read The Everlasting Man by Chesterton? Okay. How many people have read Survivals and New Arrivals by Belloc? Okay. The rest of my case. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Survivals and New Arrivals uh, by Belloc, to me, is a great work of apologetics. And what he really does, the Survivals and the New Arrivals are the heresies. The Survivals are the heresies that have hung on, hung on. they've been around for centuries, sometimes changing name, but just re re reinventing themselves with a different name. And the New Arrivals are newer things like socialism and fascism. And, you know. um, and I said, I said somewhere that the difference between Chesterton and Belloc, you know, you take Chesterton's orthodoxy, you have this person that uses his pen like a sword, you know, and uh, fences, and, uh, and he uses it like a, you know, like a lance and jousts with it, or like a firework, you have pyrotechnics. And I said that Chesterton just trundles over the horizon in a tank. <laughs> because that's exactly what survivors and new arrivals does, it just chugs along slowly, and just destroys one argument after another, after another, after another. Not as entertaining to read, but it's certainly very, very effective. 
So, just to conclude now, I like this sort of, we talk about history, we talk about a continuum. And on Sunday, we talk about the, uh, the, the Catholic revival. The Chester Bellock is part of this continuum, this living tradition. And within the context of, of the Catholic uh, revival in England, you had the figures of Newman, Manning, and Hopkins that came before them, and Elliot, Sassoon, Sitwell, and War that came afterwards. You have probably the, the, the most important, important, and arguably the best poem of the 20th century, The Wasteland, written by Elliot. You have the finest novel of the 20th century, uh, Twice Ever Visited. Both of these written by people that were profoundly Catholic and profoundly anti modern. So the perennial nature of uh, the truth to produce great art. And of course, after they had Lewis and Tolkien. Now, the reason I say that uh, Bryce had visited as the greatest novel of the 20th century is because I don't believe that Lord of the Rings is a novel. Um, but that's a, a, another, the, so the two great works of fictional literature, if you like, in the 20th century were both written by Catholics. So we have here, um, the best we should be passed probably to the snobbery, uh, the chronological snobbery of Wells uh, and Shaw and the progressives is the fact that the great minds and the great art of the 20th century uh, that still stand as, as monuments of that century were rooted in tradition. I'd like to finish with just a few quotes on tradition by Chesterton, all of which will be misquoted. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, Lewis got his uh, disdain, his contempt for chronological snobs from his love of Chesterton. Um, a lot of Lewis's work is full of this uh, disdain for chronological snobs, those that believe that they're better because they're more modern. But Chesterton said that um, a modern is someone who um, contemptuously kicks down the ladder by which he's climbed. <laughs> And he also said that tradition saves us from the degradation of being a child of our own time. He also said that tradition is the democracy of the dead and the enfranchisement of the unborn. And he also said true conservatism often believes that you, if you leave a thing alone, you leave it unchanged. And he says, if you leave a thing alone, you don't leave it unchanged, you leave it open to a torrent of change. And then he then used the example of a gate. And if you don't, con don't continue to paint the gate, it will rot. So we have this place of renovation and renewal within tradition. But this renovation and renewal is not destruction, desecration, or iconoclasm, which we often see with many uh, moderns who think they are renewing the past. And my favourite uh, remark on tradition by Chesterton is um, his philosophy of the tree. And he said basically, there are two types of philosophy. He said there's a philosophy of the tree. The philosophy of the tree is a belief in tradition. And that belief in tradition is that uh, everything is organic. It's growing, like a tree. And the bigger the tree gets, and the, the, and the wider its branches spread, and the further its leaves spread out, the deeper its roots have to be, the stronger its roots have to be. And however big the tree gets, the sack running through it is the same sack and that the middle part of the tree is the same tree as always was there. And he said against that is the philosophy of the cloud, the philosophy of relativism. But you had this sort of amorphous thing, intangible thing that's changing, that's unrooted, and ultimately is unsubstantial. That which, that which has no tradition, which is rooted, in fact not rooted, which is a slave of its time and will pass away with its time. Tolkien, who was greatly influenced by Chesterton, talked about this philosophy of the tree. And he was talking about those that wanted to go back to the early church. 
strip away everything that the Catholic Church has been over the last 1,500 years and to go back to the early church. And he said, why on earth do these people think that the seed, or indeed the, the newborn bud, newborn stem, is more mature or more majestic or more pure than the full-grown tree? And he said, in any case, he said, you can't go rummaging around for the seed because it's not there anymore. And nor is this little stippling coming up from the ground there anymore. That was the early church, that was the immature church. We have this majesty of this living church that's now 2,000 years old, that has deep roots. So the role of, role of uh, tradition, I say chest and belongs to blossom, if you like, on that tree. Wells and Shaw, many, in many ways, like the clouds. And we should remember that Wells and Shaw continue to believe in communism. They continue to believe in Stalin long after Stalin was beginning to murder millions of his own people. Wells visited Stalin at the height of the terror to tell him how wonderful he was. Um, and by the end, Shaw had basically done a, a U turn and was the most intelligent things Shaw ever wrote were the last things he wrote. And he basically he was uh, rejecting all the early things that he wrote. And H.G. Wells' last book was The Mind at the End of Its Tether. So, really, you know, who won? Chesterton and Belloc or Wells and Shaw? Now, it's not for me to say, gloat, as a Catholic, Chesterton and Belloc won. Wells and Shaw admit defeat. Now, we had. The madness of Nietzsche ending up in the madness of Nazism. The madness of Fabian Socialism of Wells and Shaw <coughs> ending up in the madness of Communism. And the result of that, of course, is the bloodiest and most murderous his, uh, century in human history. I do not know that it still exists by the million how anybody can still talk about the 20th century as showing signs of progress in any meaningful sense. So, C.S. Lewis said, fashions are always coming and going, but mostly going. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the fashion of fascism <clears throat> that's passed away. The fashion of communism that's passed away. We have uh, 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 Belloc talked about fascism and communism as the new arrivals. Well, the new arrivals already left the building space of a century. And of course communism was pulled down mainly because of the dynamic, dynamic orthodoxy of Pope John Paul II. And also the dynamic orthodoxy of the Polish nation. And what we learn from Chesterton is that orthodoxy is always dynamic. It can be nothing else. And we have these wonderful words of Chesterton again, which for purists so I apologise but I've put all these down from memory. Chesterton would be proud of me, he did the same thing. Always misquoting poetry. <laughs> he said that the church, he described the church as a heavenly chariot careering across the centuries, the dull heresies lying prostrate before it, the wild truth reeling and erect. And Belloc, in the great heresies, talked about the siege of Vienna. The siege of Vienna that if the Muslims had taken Vienna, there was every possibility that Europe would have fallen. And the siege of Vienna was lifted on the uh, September the 11th. And Belloc said, this is not a date that Islam is likely to forget. This is the nearest I've had to mark to, to true words of prophecy <coughs> for a long time. So what do we see at the end of all of this? <coughs> our history, Christian culture, Chesterton and Belloc, is that the new enemy is the old enemy. And as Chesterton and Belloc have shown us, that the antidote to the poison of heresy is the purity of orthodoxy. Thank you.